Hello and welcome. Today I am going to be discussing uh, cholera. This is an introduction to cholera and specifically the organism that causes it, Vibrio cholerae. My name is Matthew J. Greer. This, this presentation was prepared through Biology 525, which is Concepts of Medical Microbiology through Grand Canyon University. The date today is the 16th of August, 2022, and my professor is Dr. Sandra Barrera. Let's jump right into what we're going to be talking about today. So the objectives today for what we're going to be talking about are the following. We're going to talk about what is cholera, what is the disease. We're going to be talking about, you know, how it presents in humans. We're going to talk about the structure of cholera, of the actual V. cholerae, which is that Vibrio cholera. We're going to talk about what it looks like and why its fun structure determines its function. We're going to be looking at the discovery and history of the organism. Where did it show up first in human history? Who discovered it? Why is it named what it is? We're going to talk about its classification a little bit. We're going to talk about its pathogenesis, how it actually causes disease in humans. We're going to talk about its epidemiology or how it spreads from area to area. We're going to talk about how to treat cholera and how to prevent getting an infection in the first place. And then finally, we're going to end with a paper on genomic research of a serotype, which is a, like a subspecies of cholera called cholera 0139. And we're going to talk more about serotypes coming up, but I just wanted to put everything here in the objective so you know what's coming and what order it's in and what to look forward to. All right, so let's jump right into what is cholera. So what is cholera? Cholera is an acute diarrheal infection with symptoms including watery diarrhea, which we sometimes refer to as rice water stool. This is because of the sloughing of the uh, epithelial walls of the stomach create this kind of rice watery consistency of the diarrhea. We see vomiting, we see muscle cramps. Because there's a lot of watery diarrhea and a lot of vomiting, we see a lot of dehydration and shock. And so this is a pretty serious disease. Um, now, today, nowadays with you know treatments, it is not usually very fatal, but it still is very important globally annually. So annually, it causes 2.9 million infections across the globe, and it causes 95,000 deaths globally. So while it's not the most deadly disease, it is still very important to look at it, understand it, have vaccines for it, and be working on trying to create better treatment strategies. Cholera is called by the organism Vibrio cholerae, and these are these guys here. All of these little guys are these Vibrio species, these bacterium. So let's jump into this introduction of this cholera species. They are gram negative. They are a curved rod shape that we've seen on the last slide. They're bacteria. They have a singular polar flagellum. They're found in brackish water or where we have estuaries or where we see salt and uh, fresh water combine. They can form biofilms and they can live in these guys here, which are copepods. These are tiny little arthropods, usually microscopic or just barely visible. And you can catch them from drinking these infected copepods. And cholera has the unique ability that it can shrink into a spherical dormant state when conditions aren't perfect for it. And that is still infectious. So it is able to not only be in salt water, but fresh water and this brackish in between kind of state, making it very easy to contaminate drinking water. So the classification of cholera, Vibrio cholera, we're going to go through top to bottom. It's in domain bacteria. It's a prokaryote. It doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have membrane-bound organelles. So it's bacteria. It's not an archaean. So it's also, it's in kingdom bacteria. It's in phylum proteobacteria. And proteobacteria, this is that gram-negative part. These protobacteria are usually gram negative. They have a lipopolysaccharide in the outer membrane. The immune system can pick up on that when it comes into the body. Uh, gamma protobacteria is its class, and these bacterium are usually able to reduce nitrates. They can ferment glucose and sometimes lactose. They can be motile with flagella, or they can be non motile. Vibrio is motile. Uh, that we're going to talk about that in the order Vibrionales. These are facultative anaerobes, which are capable of fermentation. 
Uh, they are oxidase positive, they have oxidase, and they can have one or more flagella. Vibrio cholerae only has one. And then the genus and species name Vibrio cholerae, uh, we're going to talk about Filippo Pacini coming up in the next slide. He's kind of the historian, uh, historical kind of discoverer of cholera, but he called them Vibrions, uh, which in Latin means to quiver. Vibrio means to quiver. So it's because of these these uh, flagella that they have that they beat back and forth really quickly that they, they were quivering, so they were named Vibrions. So that's where the naming for these for this guy comes from. Uh, there are 200 serotypes, so kind of subspecies of Vibrio cholerae, but only two of them cause disease, and they are O1 and O139. And we're going to talk about what that O means later, but just remember that there's only two that cause uh, cholera most of the time. There are some species that don't normally cause cholera that can cause a little bit of enterovirus, not enterovirus, excuse me, but entero um, disease, but we will talk about that coming up. All right, so next, let's talk about the history of Vibrio cholera. So we are on our seventh pandemic of cholera currently. There have been seven pandemics in, uh, that have been documented. Until 1817, it was localized in Asia. And we're going to talk about that localization coming up. But it then spread to India, it spread to Europe, and then the whole world. So we have it in the United States, we have it in Europe, it's a, we have it in South America and the Caribbean. It's pretty much global now. So John Snow in 1854, we uh, sometimes refer to him as the father of epidemiology. There was a cholera outbreak in 1854 in London. And it was because of a pump um, that had become contaminated with cholera. It was the Broad Street pump. But John Snow was actually the first to like use a scientific process to localize where this actual disease was coming from. And it was coming from this pump. So this is a picture of his map here, John Snow's map here. And these little dashes, each one of them mark a case of cholera. So you can see around the Broad Street pump here, there was a lot of cases. But it was pretty uncommon. There was still, um, people were still thinking that miasma was the cause of a lot of illnesses or bad air and water. And I mean, they were partially right, but uh, we'll get, move on. We'll talk about Robert Koch in a little bit, and he's going to be the one who like really solidified that it was germ theory. But John Locke was able to, uh, you know, kind of figure out how cholera was spreading and stop the spread of it. So that is why we consider him the father of epidemiology. But the actual discovery of the organism V. cholerae happened twice, once by Filippo Pacini and once and again by Robert Koch. And Pacini found it in Italy and Koch found it in Egypt. But as I was saying, Robert Koch did this really cool thing where he, uh, he had a lot of different cool things that he's able to do microbiology, but one of them was the actual transmission and spread of diseases and he was the one who was pushing this germ theory of disease. So we moved away from this air is being is causing disease, and now it's actually an organism is causing this disease. So very important step forward for uh, microbiology and for our understanding of microbes such as V. cholerae. All right, the evolution of V. cholerae. Uh, cholera is currently endemic in 47 countries globally. It has an O antigen on its cell wall. This is how we determine the different serotypes apart. There are over 200, like we said, only two are really common for causing disease. The first and the, it caused pandemics one through five, as you can see in this nice timeline here. It's called classical cholera and it was this O1. And then we have uh, O1 El Tor, kind of take over, start right here, right before the seventh pandemic. Uh, the sixth pandemic was also O1 classical. The O1 El Tor kind of took over here. And then just recently, starting in the 1990s, and we're going to talk about this coming up, uh, O139, which was derived from that El Tor, arose and we see a lot of O139, but we're going to talk about why it's not the main one, why El Tor is still the main one currently. Now, both of these uh, strains of cholera, it's really important. They both produce 
uh, cholera toxin. We're going to talk about why that's important coming up and what that does to the body. But the other serotypes don't have that, and that's why they are not cholera causing. There's three waves to the seventh pandemic. We're going to talk about them. They are the different waves of LTOR and O139, and then LTOR again, waves one, two, and three. And it's just whatever organism was kind of dominant at that point in time is what that wave was. So the pathogenesis of V. cholerae. V. cholerae makes you sick, it gives you diarrhea, it makes you vomit, but why? What happens and how does it get inside of the human host? So to get sick from an organism, you need an infectious dose. And the infectious dose of V. cholerae depends on the pH of your stomach acid. If you have a higher stomach acid, you're more, um, higher pH, excuse me, you're more basic. It's easier for cholera uh, to get into your body and get into the small intestine where it really wants to go. If you have a lower pH, meaning more acidic, it is harder for cholera to get through that stomach acid and colonize the body. It has, it is really sensitive to acid. So normally, if you have a normal uh, stomach acid content, it would take around 100 million bacteria to cause an infection. If for some reason you produce less HCl, you're on a whole bunch of uh, sodium bicarbonate, you have a you know, higher chance of getting infected. V. cholerae enters the body through the fecal oral route, so it usually will like to go inside of a human host, and then as it is flushed through the digestive system in that diarrhea, it will infect water and then continue the cycle. It can also, as we said, be in these copepods, but it can also reside in cyanobacteria, it can be on biofilms. So there are many different ways that it can get into the body. But once it's into the human hosts and actually starts proliferating, the most common is that fecal oral route. So once somebody gets sick from the environment, most of the time you're gonna get cholera going from human to human via the fecal oral. Like we said earlier, the infection depends on the stomach acid pH. Lower pH, you're gonna be have a lower chance. Higher pH, you're gonna have a higher chance. And once inside the body, it produces this cholera toxin. And the cholera toxin is the one that causes the diarrhea. And we're going to talk about that next. So the cholera toxin affects a G protein. So in your normal gastrointestinal epithelial cells, you have a G protein coupled receptor that has PKA activation that gets CAMP going in there, uh, cyclic AMP, that then triggers this cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator that releases chlor you know, chloride ions when you need it to. Most of the time this is turned off though. This only works when it's activated. So if you if it's you know nice and isotonic on both sides, you're probably not going to have this going on. But this cholera endotoxin, what it does is it binds to the G protein here and it locks it into the open position. And what this does is it releases continuous amounts of chlorine from the cell. And anytime you have chlorine, it's gonna take its buddy with it, which is salt. You're always gonna find sodium chlorine together. Those ions like each other, that positive negative ionic charge. So when you're pumping out massive and massive amounts of chlorine, the sodium is gonna readily follow it. And when salt leaves, it takes water with it too. So that's why you get this very watery stool. So that's what the toxin is doing. That's why it's causing this diarrhea. A person that has uh, this loses a ton of water. If you don't replace the water, they usually die due to dehydration. But let's jump into and talk about some epidemiology of V. cholerae. All right, so for epidemiology, the Bay of Bengal, which is right here in Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Bangladesh, India here, was the central hub for cholera infections in the 1800s and early 1900s up to about 1950. And then the last common ancestor, 201, was in 1950, that classical cholera we talked about, and then now we have the LTOR and the 139, which is the more common, and the classical 01 is much less common. Cholera spreads from person to person, like we said, the medium time, uh, for infection to onset is about 1.4 days. 
But people can shed organisms one to two weeks beforehand asymptomatically. This is not usually the case, but it can happen. Areas that are higher risk for cholera are those with low sanitation and lack of clean drinking water. Cholera loves this kind of conditions. That's what happened in the outbreak in London. If there was no real good sanitation, uh, you were getting fecal matter inside of the drinking water. These happen a lot of times near bodies of water, especially these brackish bodies of water like bays and estuaries where these rivers are coming in. Same thing in London. There's a river going into the ocean there. This gives lots of opportunity for cholera to uh, come up against the human race and then infect it. All right, so the treatment of cholera. Uh, oral rehydration is the number one thing that we do for cholera patients. It's necessary to, produce, to prevent the dehydration. This oral heat rehydration is not just water, though, because you don't want to put a hypotonic into somebody's body. It will just pull more water out. So what we're going to do is we're also going to add sodium and chlorine to this. We're going to add salt to this. It's going to be a saline solution. Uh, sometimes they'll add glucose. Sometimes they'll use a rice starch instead of glucose. But it's to make sure that the body has the nutrients that it needs and make sure that it has the osmolarity that it needs because you need to replace that chlorine and sodium that are being pulled by osmotic pressure out of those uh, stomach cells. Then we'll use antibiotics, and these are used synergistically. Oral rehydration and antibiotics together gives you a much better outcome than using one or the other alone. And some successful ones for cholera are doxycycline, azithromycin, and tetracycline. And what these do and what the point of their, you know, kind of giving these uh, antibiotics is to decrease the duration of the disease, to shorten that disease. Uh, nobody wants to continue to have uh, vomit and watery diarrhea and muscle cramps for a longer period of time than necessary. So getting these antibiotics in there to not only decrease the duration of the disease, but also to prevent more spread. If people aren't sick as long, they don't have as much chance to spread the disease to, to other individuals. And the third and kind of least common thing on the list here, uh, as far as in the United States, would be vaccination using live attenuated uh, cholera or inactivated whole cell cholera. These are more common in areas that are endem more endemic or have outbreaks that are currently going on. If you're going to travel to an area, you can, that is high kind of outbreaks of cholera, you can get vaccinated beforehand, but you uh, normally don't receive a cholera vaccine in the United States because we don't run into it enough here. All right, the prevention of infection from V. cholera. You want to uh, do anything you can to keep this organism from getting inside of your small intestine. So that means not drinking contaminated water, so drinking bottled water uh, wherever you go, you know, to a new area that is endemic with this. You want to drink bottled water. And, you know, you have no kind of tolerance or resistance built up to it yet, so that's good. Uh, wash your hands frequently and make sure that you're using soap and that you're using clean water. If you're washing your hands with dirty water, uh, you're just introducing cholera to your system. You're not getting rid of it. Avoid raw meat and seafood. Uh, probably not a good idea to take leftovers. You know, do as best you can to make sure that your food is fresh and well-maintained, well-refrigerated if you have to do any kind of leftovers. Uh, vaccinations and cleaning is also a really good thing that this uh, graphic here has on it. Um, we talked about those a little bit in the treatment side. The World Health Organization and the Global Task Force on Cholera Control has a global plan that they're implementing, and their goal is to reduce cholera deaths by 90% and stop infections of cholera in 20 countries by the year 2030. So, and they're planning on doing water treatment, they're planning on making vaccinations and uh, antimicrobials more available, as well as continuing to research cholera and figure out how to how to beat this organism. And the last thing we're going to talk about before I set you guys free is we're going to talk about this paper on the genomic research of why uh, 0139 didn't cause an eighth pandemic. This is by Ramamurthy et al. Come out this year, 2022. Uh, really exciting genetic sequencing research uh, that was done. We got some really nice, we got a really nice picture here to talk about the phylogenetic tree that was created. So this study assessed uh, the phylogenetic positions of V. cholera 0139, uh, the genomes of them and the typing. 
as we talked earlier, 0139 originated in the early 1990s. This uh, paper is analyzing DNA from 0139, and it's looking at the whole genome sequence-based phylogenetic analysis. And what we can tell from this is, what the researchers found out from this, is that uh, 0139 was the cause of recombination of genetics from the O1L tor and O22. So it's not something that's just brand new, out of nowhere. It's kind of this meshing of these two. The phylogenetic tree for all of cholera is here on the top. And then this little tiny box here that is blown up is what we call the seven pet or the LTOR strain or serotype. And inside of here, we have this O1, like I was talking earlier, we have these three waves where we had O1 that started the seventh pandemic, was looking really good, and then out of nowhere comes this O139. And for a large part of the seventh pandemic, it was dominant and it really, really quickly outcompeted the O1. We were very, um, you know, globally, it was a big concern. The initial uh, infection process was strong, and we we made vaccines, we modified current vaccines to specifically target this O139 strain because we were super worried that it would uh, blow up into an eighth global pandemic, and then it didn't. It just it let you can see here it let way to these other O1L tours, these other kind of serotypes and that took over. Uh, at the end, in the third wave here of the seventh pandemic. So what happened to the 0139? Because it's still, uh, it's still virulent. It still gets can get you sick today, but it lost some of its virulence, and this was due to a loss of uh, the homozygous coding for the cholera toxin. So, based on genetic analysis, originally this had a homozygous strong uh, homozygously strong and that the cytotoxin uh, the different strains of it the different genetics of it went from a more virulent successful cytotoxin to a now heterogeneous uh, less successful allele for this that was worth looking for allele for this cytotoxin for this cholera toxin so now that it is creating a less a st less strong uh, immune less strong excuse me infection process there are less cholera being uh, dispersed less cholera being successful in invading human tissue and as well as that 0139 also lost some of its antimicrobial resistance genes so it lost uh, a lot of its ability to be toxic and it lost its ability to have antimicrobial resistance where the O1L tor has retained both of those it still has that really strong uh, cholera toxin and it has that really and it's having antimicrobial resistance still so because of this the 0139 is not the prevalent uh of species anymore the serotype now the 01 l tor is back on top and is continuing that third wave of the seventh pandemic how exciting we went over a lot of material today uh, these are all the references that I used to create this presentation there are a lot of them um, I hope though that you have a better understanding about what cholera is uh, a great understanding on the organism that causes it Vibrio cholerae I hope you understand its structure its function uh, kind of a little bit the biochemistry on how it actually creates its pathogenesis how is it spread epidemiology the kind of a history of it and I hope you enjoyed that uh, article and paper and publication on why the O139 type isn't the more prevalent and successful cholera serotype. Uh, thank you so much for watching and have an excellent rest of your day.